Egyptians actually look like this. Scientists have found mummy after mummy after mummy of all these Egyptian pharaohs or kings that look like this, with orange or blonde hair. These kings had the R1A haplogroup Aryan or European gene. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Indeed, CJ, that's exactly how I felt after watching that video. But the most significant issue goes beyond this. The real problem lies in the response to that video, coming from a TikToker known for debunking myths. He attempted to provide a fact-based answer, which seemed well-intentioned, but ended up adding more confusion to the topic. This TikToker has millions of followers, and his videos have been viewed by hundreds of thousands, possibly millions by now. Many of these viewers may consider his answers to be true. In essence, despite his efforts to provide a fair answer, he inadvertently misleads millions of people. That's why I am determined to address both videos as accurately as possible. Now, before we dive in, let's listen to the response from the second TikToker, Aslan Pahari. Hello, my friend. Were ancient Egyptians European-like in appearance? Well, I would say to simply say yes would be misleading. Mummies that have been found with colored hair, that itself is quite a rare occurrence and should not be seen as a representation of the general appearance of ancient Egyptians. Ancient Egypt was a great civilization with a large population that faced migration over centuries. So obviously the migrations are going to affect the gene pool of the native population, especially in urban areas. Aslan's response is intriguing. As I mentioned earlier, he's trying to provide accurate answers, but there are some significant errors. The original video talks about archaeologists finding mummy after mummy after mummy with blonde and orange hair. Found mummy after mummy after mummy. Meaning that the ancient Egyptians resembled Europeans. Aslan, however, states that Kemet was an ancient civilization with a large population influenced by migrations, which impacted their gene pool. Is it true? In my opinion, absolutely. To explore this topic in greater detail, I highly recommend watching my in-depth video dedicated to this aspect. Now let's go back to Oslin's answer to the question. Well then, what did they actually look like? Well, genetic studies tell us that they were genetically shifted towards the populations of the Near East. Which basically means that the populations that existed within ancient Egypt, much of those populations may have appeared physically similar to populations within the Middle East. What did the ancient Egyptians truly look like? Aslan references a study conducted by the Max Planck Institute in 2017 to support his argument. According to that study, the populations of ancient Egypt exhibited genetic shifts towards the populations of the Middle East. While this may seem like a well-founded argument supported by scientific research, it is, unfortunately, biased and misleading. Allow me to clarify why. The primary issue revolves around the timeline. Most of us associate locations to the population that currently occupy it. In other words, to the populations we see living there today. However, it does not work like that. People migrate, mix, fight, experience genocides, or flee conflicts areas, resulting in populations today that may not fully resemble those of millennia ago. The United States offers a perfect example of this phenomenon with its indigenous population as discussed in this video. Regarding the study cited by Aslan, I have previously addressed it in numerous videos, especially in this one, where I examine all genetic studies related to the ancient Egyptian population. Let's take a look. 2017 Abu Sir El Melek. The third one occurred in 2017, when a highly publicized study emerged as a landmark in the field of ancient Egyptian research. The study involved the extraction of DNA from 150 mummies found in the city of Abu Sir El Melek, located in Middle Egypt. These mummies spanned from the late New Kingdom to the Greco-Roman period, providing a comprehensive timeline of ancient Egyptian history. But contrary to the previous mummies, these were not royal mummies, but some random inhabitants of the area of unknown origin. Through extensive analyses, scientists revealed intriguing findings that garnered significant attention. The DNA extracted from the mummies displayed stronger genetic affinities with populations from the Near East and Europe compared to modern Egyptians. This discovery was attributed to an 8% increase in the African genetic component. 
Since its publication, this study has been widely referenced by mainstream media and the majority of experts as a definitive answer to the ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians. In essence, this study is often used by mainstream sources discussing ancient Egypt. It is presented as a definitive answer as it links the population of Kemet to the Middle East. However, contrary to what is said, these results only concern three randomly selected mummies out of a group of 151, all from an area that had experienced centuries of foreign influence. Numerous indications of foreign settlements in that region during the same period further complicate matters. Aslan also mentions the migration of foreigners into urban areas, which is indeed accurate. In our understanding of Kemet, the north, where the pyramids stand, is often seen as the heart of the civilization. However, the most critical regions were in the south, as detailed in this video. For instance, the Valley of the Kings, where major pharaohs were buried, is situated in the south, near Thebes. In a modern context, this would be equivalent to a city like New York, a cosmopolitan area with a blend of ethnicities among the native population. However, the true centers of power, similar to Washington, D.C. in modern terms, were in the South. The elite families, who valued their lineage, tended to intermarry. Evidence of endogamy among Kemet's elites is well documented. We can make a parallel with modern populations. People usually blend in terms of class. It was the same back then, especially among the members of royal families and nobility. The temples of Amen, the principal deity during Kemet's Golden Age, were also located in the south. The priesthood of Amen resided in Thebes, and the leading families headquartered themselves in these regions. The city of origin of Haru, or Horus, is also in the south, even further south than Thebes. Consequently, when scientists study mummies from northern Kemet, it is highly probable that these individuals were not fully representative of the native population. They might have been Egyptians, but of foreign origin. Studying mummies from the southern regions reduces this likelihood. Now, let's address another error made by Aslan concerning the appearance of the Kemet population. Aslan references the genetic study we discussed earlier to link the population of Kemet to the Middle East. However, the issue extends beyond this study. It relates to the connection between genes and physical appearance. One's appearance, or phenotype, is not solely determined by their genes. To identify someone's phenotype accurately, we do not rely on genetics. Instead, we turn to anthropology. A few years ago, some geneticists introduced a system that attempted to identify phenotypes using genetics. Still, it was widely discredited by serious geneticists, as it was deemed random and incapable of providing accurate results. Therefore, not only is the study we discussed earlier flawed due to sample size, location, and time frame, but it also employs the wrong data to address the question of Kemet's entire population. To this day, the most reliable method for determining someone's phenotype is through anthropological analysis. We'll delve deeper into this topic later in the video since several of Oslin's future points also relate to this matter. My goal is to provide a comprehensive answer that covers all his arguments for better understanding. Be sure to stick around until the end. Now, onto the juicy stuff. Now, your next point was about haplogroups and how certain pharaohs carried the R1A haplogroup associated with modern-day European populations. Yes, that was the case for Pharaoh Tutankhamun, but we got to remember that Egypt has had a variety of dynasties that have ruled over the civilization. And we have minimal examples of what haplogroups were prevalent within each dynasty. We know from Tutankhamun that R1A was present. However, from Ramses III, we know that E1 was present, which is a haplogroup associated with native populations within Africa. What I'm trying to say is that to say Egypt was white or black in race doesn't make much sense. Egypt was a great civilization with a large population geographically positioned to neighbor a variety of regions with very different looking people. So different looking people are going to be migrating in and mixing with the population. In, in this segment, Aslan perpetuates a complete falsehood, which is perplexing, to say the least. Maybe he overlooked fact checking. To address this issue, let's revisit one of my videos in which I discuss all known studies related to the ancient Egyptian populations. When in 2020, 
their Y chromosome was examined, revealing an affiliation with the R1B haplogroup, which has its roots in West Asia and is today the most common in Western Europe. But contrary to what has been spread, both results are not incompatible since R1B is still present in Africa, notably among Central Africans in Chad and Cameroon. It has been present in Africa since prehistoric times, as attested by the following study, and was there even prior to its spread to Western Europe, where it is today the most common. 2000. Oslin's first and most significant error relates to the haplogroup found in Tutankhamun. It is not O1A, but O1B. The first time I watched this TikTok video, I almost lost my mind. I couldn't understand how such a lie was able to spread. This information is readily available everywhere, making it nearly impossible to miss. This situation reminds me of a comment from one of my followers who noted that every time we debunk falsehoods related to Kimmet, mainstream media move the goalposts to validate their false claims. That's precisely what's happening here. The first time War 1B was linked to the 18th dynasty, many individuals considered it evidence that ancient Egyptians were Europeans. However, they overlooked a critical detail I'm about to share with you. Watch this. 2012 DNA Tribes In January 2012, DNA Tribes conducted the first significant study that reverberated across the globe. Their meticulous analysis of mummies from the 18th dynasty unveiled a startling connection to Central and West Africans. The revelation was further... They failed to mention that despite carrying the OR-1B haplogroup, the royal family's autosomal DNA revealed a stronger connection to Central, West, and Southern African populations. In essence, they were African OR-1B carriers. We know that OR-1B has a long history in Africa, as mentioned in a previous segment. Many African populations carry this haplogroup while also exhibiting physical characteristics associated with indigenous African populations. So, these factors make it less likely that they were white Europeans coming to Africa to build civilizations, as their depictions further confirm. Now, the goalposts have shifted from or one b to or one a But why? What significance does this hold? Well, the Orwana haplogroup is distributed across a vast Eurasian region, extending from Scandinavia and Central Europe to Central Asia, Southern Siberia, and South Asia. It barely touches the extreme north of Africa. If this becomes the prevailing narrative, it would make it impossible for King Tut and ancient Egyptians to be considered black, as this lineage does not exist among black populations. This narrative transforms African Egyptians into Scandinavian Egyptians, which is a falsehood. King Tut belonged to or one b and his autosomal DNA connected him and his family to Central, West, and Southern Africans. Aslan should have fact-checked his information before creating that video. While he often produces engaging content, when he ventures into discussing Kemet, things tend to get messy. Now, let's address the final part of his video. In my opinion, if you want to know what ancient Egyptians looked like, just look at modern Egyptians. They aren't the direct descendants. This portion is the reason I created the following videos. If you're interested in uncovering the truth, I highly recommend watching them. I delve deep into the subject, addressing studies typically overlooked by mainstream sources. After watching these videos, I encourage you to form your conclusions. I don't want to dictate your perspective, even though I can be quite assertive about my beliefs sometimes. I want you to critically analyze the data and decide what makes the most sense. Now, let's talk about anthropology. As I explained earlier, a person's appearance is determined by their phenotype, which, in turn, is defined by their bone structure. This leads us to the field of anthropology. While genes can provide hints about someone's facial features, such as eye and hair color, to truly understand what they look like, we rely on anthropology. So, what does anthropology reveal about the appearance of ancient Egyptians? Well, numerous renowned anthropologists seem to agree on one key aspect. From these studies, it becomes evident that the original population of Kemet at major historical sites exhibited a feature typically associated with black populations today, subnasal prognathism. 
Furthermore, Eric Krubazi's research affirms that the phenotype of ancient Egyptians remained remarkably consistent until significant disruptions in their history. The first major disruption occurred with the Hyksos invasion, while the most pronounced changes took place during the late period, coinciding with the Greco-Roman era. This era witnessed an increase in mummies with blonde and red hair, indicating that these features began to appear with foreign occupations. In other words, if they resembled black people in the beginning, they remained that way for the major part of their existence. When we examine depictions of ancient Egyptians, we often find that most pharaohs and the general population had typical African features. The Great Sphinx, in particular, bears these characteristics, as does the majority of the population, with features like afro hair and locks. There are occasional depictions that may appear ambiguous, but for the most part, the Kemet population resembled Africans in all their diversity. We can also consider what contemporary civilizations, both European and Asiatic, had to say about them. If you're curious, I recommend watching these videos. Before concluding this video, I'd like to emphasize why we revisit certain topics from various angles. It's because, as soon as we stop, the goalposts are moved, new tricks or manipulations appear, and new ways to distort African history emerge. While discussing all aspects of African history is essential, I occasionally return to these fundamentals to keep the discussion alive. I hope you now appreciate the importance of these reminders. But enough from me. What are your thoughts on all of this? Do you agree with me, or do you believe the TikTokers are correct? Pick your side and share your arguments in the comments below. Let's engage in a constructive dialogue, learning from each other's perspectives. I'm genuinely curious to hear your opinions. Thanks for watching Mr. Emodup's channel and see you in the next video.